Hello there. Blessings and peace to one and all. Welcome once again to Bible Beyond the Basics. I am Dr. Clinton Baldwin of Tequila Ministries International, 66A Brunswick Avenue in Spanish Town, and the Baldwin's Biblical Manuscript Research Institute. We will continue our series on the Sabbath, and in this setting of Bible Beyond the Basics, I would like to rehearse, elaborate, and clarify our last presentation on the Sabbath in Genesis 2. We are out of retreat, so call your friends and let them know that Bible Beyond the Basics has begun. In our last presentation, we learned that, one, at the end of creation week, God ceased or rested from his work of creation, blessed and sanctified the seventh day. Two, the seventh day was unlike the other days of creation week in that, while the other days of creation week were bounded by evening and morning, the seventh day was not bounded by evening and morning. This indicates that theologically it was an open-ended day. When I say theologically it was an open-ended day, this is not to deny that it was a 24-hour period. It was indeed a 24-hour period historically, but theologically it was not a 24-hour period. It was an unending period. As we proceed, the distinction and tremendous significance between a theological truth and an historical truth will become clear. Point number three, there is no explicit command in the entire book of Genesis to keep the Sabbath. Nowhere is it said that Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath, and more importantly, nowhere throughout the entire book of Genesis do we see any of the patriarchs like Noah, Enoch, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, etc. keeping the Sabbath. We observe that there are examples of these patriarchs keeping every other commandment except the Sabbath. We never see where it is said, for example, that Abram or Isaac or Jacob pitched his tent, cease from work, and worship on the seventh day. Four, we also discovered that for a number of reasons, it is not reasonable to assume that they kept the Sabbath simply because they kept other commandments like thou shalt not kill or thou shalt not commit adultery or honor your parents, etc. The reason being, these commandments are all laws revealed by natural revelation. That is, it is within the natural psyche of all human beings not to kill, steal, commit adultery, marry, obey one's parents, etc. In all cultures, ancient or modern, whether or not there are written or oral pronouncements, human beings know that they should not do these things. However, there is nothing in human psyche or natural revelation, we could say, that pricks the conscience of anyone and alerts him or her that a particular 24-hour period every week that is the seventh day, is holy and, sh and one should stop from work and rest and worship. Therefore, that the patriarchs kept the other commandments of the Decalogue cannot form the basis of the assumption that they also kept the seventh day. Again, the other commandments are all actions intrinsic to the psyche of all humans, but the cessation from work, rest and worship on a particular 24-hour period every week is not, was not, and is not a part of natural revelation. Please permit me to el elaborate on this point some more. We have several laws from the ancient world outside of the nation of Israel, Sumerian, Babylonians, Assyrian, Egyptians, and Hittite law codes, law codes written hundreds of years before the Ten Commandments were codified. Collectively, these codes contain hundreds of laws, and many of these laws parallel or echo every one of the Ten Commandments, but with one and only one exception, that is, the Sabbath commandment. I say it again. There are several law codes outside of the Bible, many of them written hundreds of years before the laws of the Bible, and these codes contain laws that parallel every single one of the Ten Commandments except the Sabbath commandment. What's the significance? Every other commandment of the Decalogue, more or less, emerges from the natural psyche of human beings except the Sabbath commandment. Therefore, if it were to be kept, it had to be revealed directly. Hence, that it was not explicitly commanded in Genesis 2 cannot be taken for granted that it was indeed a requirement from the beginning or that anyone like the patriarchs kept it. Just look around you and... Uh, the Sabbath commandment 
is the only commandment that the only way you come to observe it is if someone verbally convinces you to do so. Strange how the Bible teaches that God's law would be written on our hearts, you know, the hearts of his children, but the only commandment never shown to be written upon the hearts of God's children or human beings in a whole is the Sabbath commandment. Again, it substantiates the point that it was not explicitly commanded. It was not given and hence would not have been obeyed. So let's retire the argument that Adam and Eve and the patriarchs kept the Sabbath. The weight of evidence leans heavily in the direction that they did not keep the Sabbath because no such commandment was given in Eden and throughout the entire book of Genesis. Moving on, point number five. Genesis 26 verse 5 says that Abraham kept God's commandments, statutes, and laws. Some people use this text to say, hey, there you have it. Abraham kept God's commandments, statutes, and laws. The Sabbath was a part of God's commandments, statutes, and laws. Therefore, Abraham also kept the Sabbath. No, not so fast. When the Bible says that Abraham kept all God's commandments, statutes, and laws, it can only mean that Abraham kept all those commandments, statutes, and laws that were revealed to him, Abraham. It does not and cannot mean that Abraham kept every commandment and law there were or that the Sabbath was a command during his time. Remember the example I gave, Leviticus 18.9, which stipulates that a man should not marry his sister with a half or full sister? Abraham married to Sarah, his half-sister, Genesis 20, 12. On that ground, he was not keeping all God's statutes and laws. Deuteronomy 21, 15 through to 18 says, If a man has two wives, his birthright should only be given to the firstborn son, even if the firstborn son was not the son of the wife he loved most. Abraham had two wives, Sarah and Agar, and he gave the birthright to Isaac, his second son, the son of of Sarah, the wife he loved most. Therefore, on these two grounds, and there are others, Abraham was not keeping all God's statutes, commandments, and laws. So while Abraham was keeping all God's commandments, he was not keeping all God's commandments. He was only keeping all the laws that he knew, and there is absolutely no evidence, even by the shred of an example, that he knew about the Sabbath commandment. Therefore, again, there is no basis for saying that Abraham or any of the patriarchs in Genesis kept the Sabbath. Think about it. Genesis is the book of beginnings. This is what the word means. The book marks the beginning of the planet, the beginning of the human race, the beginning of special covenantal family, the beginning of the nations, among others. Apart from recording absolutely no initial example of humans keeping the Sabbath, the Hebrew noun Sabbath never occur in the book of Genesis. You want to tell me that there was a requirement for all peoples in every age to stop from work, rest, and worship every seventh day, and there is absolutely no mention or, or even an, an half example of someone keeping the Sabbath in the book of beginnings, yet at the same time, such deafening silence is to be a key basis for whether or not one becomes a member of the body of Christ, the church. You want to tell me that such argument from silence is to form the platform as to whether or not you have the seal of God, the key identifying mark of God's remnant church. You want to tell me that an assumption is to form the basis for Sabbath keeping today? Come on. Imagine you are a teacher setting an exam for your students, and there is a decisive question that determines whether or not the students pass the exam. You never explicitly mention the question in the lesson or in the exam itself, yet the students ought to answer that implied question lest they fail the exam, or at least not be reckoned among the special elite, quote unquote, remnant set of students. This is what we are saying when we use Genesis chapter 2 as the basis for Sabbath keeping today. Come on, let's be intellectually honest. We are Christians. Point number six. Did God command it by example? That again would be another assumption because the Sabbath signified the presence of God. God made blessings, blessings, sanctification, sanctification. In the Old Testament, it is the presence of God that blesses and sanctifies. Remember the example of Moses at the burning bush, Exodus 3, 3 to 5, ordinary bush, 
But when God's presence arrived, the bush and the place became holy ground. So if it is the presence of God that makes holiness holiness and blessings blessings, then to speak of the Sabbath in these terms mean a special representation of God's presence with his creation. Now, why would God want to command, his, command the observance of his presence once per week in an environment in which his presence was always available every day of the week? Tiresome labor was not a part of Adam and Eve's experience before sin, so there would be no need for them to work and rest or cease from working to acknowledge the presence of God in whose presence they enjoyed a life without tiresome labor. That is perpetual rest, literally every day. You do not take a vacation from your vacation while you're on the vacation. Therefore, the Sabbath as a rest and worship day was not relevant to Adam and Eve. You model for someone that which is relevant to the person. God had no need in paradise to model to Adam and Eve an irrelevant command or situation. But a fair question that could be asked is, was God setting the day apart for himself then? Not likely. So the Sabbath command was not relevant to Adam and Eve, and God was not setting it apart for himself. So what then? There are at least two other options. Option number one, by resting, blessing, and sanctifying the seventh day, God was making the theological point that he was always with his creation. Let me now clarify the distinction between a theological truth and an historical factuality where the Bible is concerned. A theological truth is the deeper or desired meaning behind an historical reality. For example, the statement, Jesus died, is an historical factuality. Nothing special per se. People live and die every day. However, the statement, Jesus died for our sins, is a theological truth. That's the meaning that makes his death different from all other deaths. So when it is said that God ceased, sanctified, and blessed the Sabbath, the theological truth is that God, having completed a perfect creation, never intended to resume the work of creation. Hence, he was now always available for his creatures. That is why the seventh day, unlike the other days of creation week, was not bounded by evening and morning. Because God's presence and, and availability cannot be bounded by time. Neither would God need to command his presence where his presence existed irrespective of time. So, significance number one pertaining to God's rest, sanctification, and blessings of the seventh day, is that God was available to be with that which he had made, not that he was issuing a specific command for mankind to keep every seventh day of the week. Looking at the same meaning from another angle, remember I said last week that the Genesis creation story was written thousands of years after creation. Hence, it reflected the cultures and worldview of the time of writing, earliest 1000 BC. In the ancient world, when the gods or Yahweh is said to have rested, it would be understood by the ancient reader that God took up his presence in his sanctuary or temple. In the culture of the ancient world, 1000 BC, the sanctuary was where the gods rested. In several places in the, in the Old Testament, like 2 Chronicles 6, 41, 1 Chronicles 23, 25, Psalm 132, verse 8, and 13, 14, Isaiah 66, verse 1, Yahweh is said to rest in his sanctuary. So when in Eden God created a world and associate rest with it, it meant that he had created a sanctuary, a resting place. The world was now God's sanctuary. And by the way, that again is another strong ancient Near Eastern theme. But if the world was God's sanctuary, then it meant holy space, holy time, holy enclave throughout the entire world at all times. Because the entire space of a sanctuary was always holy. So the indication of the seventh day being blessed, sanctified, and being a point of rest would have been understood by the primary audience back then as communicating the theological message that God was with his creation for all times, not that God was commanding the mandatory observance of his presence once per week. It was a metaphor or theological truth of a deeper reality, the presence of God 
always. Again, anchored in the fact that the day is not said to be bounded by evening and mornings, and uh, no command to keep the day. And uh, this leads me to the second reason why Genesis 2 reports that God blessed and sanctified the seventh day. The author of Genesis was writing thousands of years after the creation was after the creation story. Was, and he was writing to substantiate the keeping of the Sabbath at the time of writing, that is, thousands of years after Genesis 2, not the keeping of the Sabbath in Genesis 2 thousands of years earlier. This is a more reasonable position to take as to why God set apart the Sabbath in Genesis 2. It was not to impose or command a mandatory rest day on Adam and Eve. Such was not relevant to them, nor was it to set it apart for himself to acknowledge every seventh day. But in true covenant style, God was simply making the theological statement that he intended to tabernacle with, may I say sanctuary, to be with his creation for all times. Later, when we study the Ten Commandments, we will see that although the Sabbath in Exodus 20 is based on the concept of rest in Genesis 2, the Sabbath in Exodus 20 is not one and the same as the Sabbath in Genesis 2. The Sabbath in Exodus 20 served a different function then, which was to point backwards to the eternal, all-pervasive rest of Genesis 2, and also forwards to the unending rest in Jesus, when God's presence once again restored in a special way to his people at all times. You see, in Jesus, God came to be with mankind forever. And in Jesus, mankind has gone to be with God forever. He's a God-man. In Jesus, Eden stands restored. But that's for future study. Let's take a pause. I'll be right back. Washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and known. Before the break, we amassed so many arguments to demonstrate that the Sabbath was not commanded in Eden, and hence Genesis 2 cannot be the basis for Sabbath keeping today. But after all these arguments, let's bend backwards over and say that the Sabbath was commanded in Genesis 2, whether by precept or by example. Does that mean that it is obligatory today? We said in the last presentation that for a number of reasons that would not be the case. Why? One, the Bible teaches that God's laws throughout Scripture are always given within the context of covenants. Two, the fact that a particular law is binding under one covenant does not mean that the said law is required under a later covenant or that it was given under a previous covenant. Three, we are not under the Genesis covenantal arrangement. Therefore, what obtained in Eden is not necessarily a requirement for us today. Again, the Bible presents Genesis creation story as covenant. Remember, God's covenant in Bible times entailed, one, a mighty act of God by which he brought order out of chaos, and two, the ensuing laws that flow from the same mighty act. So Genesis creation story was indeed covenant. The Bible in Hosea chapter 6 verse 7, Jeremiah 33 verse 20 and 25, refers to the creation story as covenant. There are five major covenantal arrangements in Scripture. One, the Edenic Covenant, Genesis 1 and 2, Hosea 6, 7, etc. Two, the Noahic Covenant, Genesis 8 and 9. Three, the Abrahamic Covenant, Genesis chapters 12 through to 17. Four, the Sinaitic Covenant, otherwise called the Old Covenant, Exodus 19, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and 5. And five, the covenant with Jesus at the cross, otherwise refers, referred to as the new covenant, Matthew 26, 28. 
that a particular law is binding under one covenant does not mean that the said law is binding under another covenant. In fact, one is only obligatory to keep the laws as those laws emanate from the covenant under which one stands. Stated another way, the constitutional basis for obedience is always the covenant under which one is governed. Again, we are not under the Edenic Covenant, so we cannot say that a particular law is binding simply because it was a command in Eden. So even if the Sabbath was commanded in Genesis and is not, that would not make it obligatory on us today. As mentioned previously, all Christians, including Jesus, have not been living according to God's commands in Genesis. Yes, you heard me correctly. All Christians, including Jesus, have not been living according to God's commands in Genesis. What am I talking about? In Eden, Adam and Eve was commanded to eat only fruits, Genesis 1, 29 and 30. Contrary to that command, no one Israel were commanded to eat meat and vegetables, Genesis 9, 3, Leviticus 11. Are we sinning when we eat other foods such as vegetables and meat? In fact, Jesus himself ate meat, see John 21, 9 through 13. He was not living according to Eden. In Eden, marriage was an ordinance. Contrary to Eden, Jesus never got married. Again, he was out of step with Eden. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 taught that marriage is optional. That is contrary to Eden. It is not now a sin against God if one refuses to get married or have babies. However, such a decision is contrary to God's command in Eden. In Eden, Adam and Eve went naked. Are we sinning today by wearing clothes? No one would want to go around and play with a lion or a tiger or try to subdue them simply because such was a command in Eden. Adam was commanded to subdue all the animals, Genesis 1.28. Are we sinning against God by not being in control of all animals that come across our path? The point is, even if the Sabbath was commanded in Eden, that would not make it a requirement today because we are not under the Edenic covenant or the Edenic arrangement of laws. And indeed, we are not now complying with Edenic laws. That which is appropriate for the Behavior under one covenant is not appropriate for behavior under another covenant. That which was appropriate for behavior in a sinless environment is not necessarily appropriate for behavior in a sinful environment. But it does not stop there. It gets even more interesting. If we today are obligated to keep the seventh day Sabbath because it originated in Genesis, then we are also obligated to keep all the so-called ceremonial Sabbaths, such as Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, Day of Atonement, etc., because they too have their roots in Genesis creation story. Sad to say, this is not a known truth among most Sabbatarians. Many may be hearing this for the first time. I'll show you the evidence in a moment, but please, First, let me pause a few seconds and call upon all Seventh-day Adventist Bible scholars, people who make their living from studying the Bible in the original languages, people who are the thought leaders of their church. Please, I'm asking you to level with your members in a more forthright manner and let them know about these facts that I'm presenting regarding the Sabbath in Genesis 2. I know many of you have been saying these things quietly, but your members are not hearing you. Please, speak louder. Many lives are being lost because of your whispering. In another program, I will speak to the implications for crime and violence and death by the thousands in some places like Jamaica. This is absolutely no joke matter. But let me continue. Again, if you say the Seventh-day Sabbath is obligatory because of its Genesis roots, then the so-called ceremonial Sabbaths must also be obligatory because they too originated in Genesis before sin. Evidence? Speaking of the sun, moon, and stars, Genesis 1 verse 14 reads, Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. The Hebrew word translated seasons, moed, must not be understood to mean spring, summer, autumn, winter. Rather, moed signifies the designated 
holy times like the Sabbath, the new moon, the Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, Day of Atonement, all the special holy times in Israel. Leviticus 23, 1 and 2, the Lord spoke again to Moses saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, The Lord appointed times, Moed, which you shall proclaim on holy convocation. My appointed times are these, the Sabbath, verse 3, the Passover, verse five, verses 5 and 8. Pentecost, verse 21, Trumpets, verse 24 and 25, Day of Atonement, verses 27 through 32, Feast of Booth, verses 34 through 36. In concluding the list of these appointed holy times, Leviticus 23, 44 reads, So Moses declared to the sons of Israel, These are the appointed moids, seasons of the Lord. For other references, you may see Deuteronomy 31, verse 12, and Numbers 9 and verse 2. Point, according to Genesis 1, 14, all the so-called ceremonial Sabbaths were resident in, or may I say, symbolized in the Genesis creation story. In other words, all the Sabbaths pointed to the Genesis creation story. Therefore, if the Seventh-day Sabbath is obligatory because it pointed to creation, then logically Sabbaths like Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, Passover are also obligatory as well because they too pointed to the Genesis creation story. However, most Sabbatarians, led by Seventh-day Adventists, say these ceremonial Sabbaths are abolished. I'm sorry, but they are being extremely inconsistent, and some, frankly, are being intellectually dishonest. And the converse is also true. If the so-called ceremonial Sabbaths are not obligatory because they pointed to the cross as per current SDA beliefs, then the Seventh-day Sabbath is also not obligatory because it too pointed to the cross. All that the day represented creation, sanctification, redemption, liberation, justification, seal of God, Jesus is. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1, 30 and 31. By his, God's, doing, you are all in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. These qualities are the meanings given to the Sabbath in the Old Testament. The New Testament here is explicitly saying that Jesus is the only reality of these things. Righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and justification. How under God's heavens can one have a problem in saying that Jesus is the Sabbath? Yes, people, he is the fulfillment of all that the day symbolized. He is the fulfillment of all the laws of the Old Testament. Romans 10 verse 4, John 5, 39 and 40, Galatians 3, 19 through the 25. The Sabbath is obviously one of the laws in the Old Testament. Therefore, he is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. Indeed, Jesus is all that the day represented. If he's not the meaning, the epitome, the consummation of the Sabbath, then the day has absolutely no meaning. Stop keeping it then. Again, in Jesus, God came to be with mankind, and in Jesus, humanity has gone to be with God forever. In Jesus, the Edenic Sabbath has been restored. Please celebrate him as such, and take your eyes off a day. The sum of what I am saying is that the Genesis creation story is not the basis for Sabbath keeping for the Christian today. The greatest of God's revelation to us was not Eden, but God's revelation in Jesus at the cross. The New Testament teaches that God's revelation in Jesus is the decisive lens through which all God's prior revelations must be defined and measured. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, Matthew 5 to 7. We must therefore interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament and not the New Testament in light of the Old Testament. Where Christian behavior is concerned, we must begin with Jesus and the New Testament and not with Adam and the Old Testament. So please cut the talk about the Sabbath came from Genesis 1, therefore it is obligatory. I'm sorry, no disrespect, but it's curious Bible study, man. It is proof texting, that is a context-blind approach to scripture, and it is wrong. Please do not say that Jesus was also in Genesis. That is also sloppy. The real issue is whether or not God's revelation in Eden through Jesus, if you will, is one and the same with God's revelation with Jesus at the cross.
The issue is whether or not God's revelation in Eden is a decisive and final revelation of God through which all other relations of God must be defined and measured. The entire New Testament teaches that the historic and resurrected Jesus is God's final voice to humanity, not God's ruling in Genesis 1 and 2. Therefore, there is absolutely no point in saying that because the Sabbath was obligatory in Eden, then it is required for us today. That is classic proof text in context by an approach to Scripture. And I am aware of many objections like Exodus 28 to 11 and Mark 2 27. Granted, these are baby objections. I'll be dealing with them further. Let's affirm what we have already seen in this study, and that is the Sabbath was not commanded in Eden, and even if it were commanded in Eden, that would not make it obligatory on us today. Why? God's laws throughout Scripture are always given within the context of covenant, and we are not under the Edenic covenant. We are under the covenant of Jesus and the cross, and the revelation of God in the historic and resurrected Jesus is the only basis for obedience today. I am very aware that psychologically these truths are very, very difficult for many people to accept. Too many Sabbatarians, because of fear, religious pride, and extreme self-confidence, have closed their minds on the issue. Sad to say, many Sabbatarians are led to believe that research and new findings can be accomplished in almost every area of biblical studies except the Sabbath. Nothing could be further from the truth. However, Sabbatarians, particularly SDAs, as you listen to these studies, you will come to realize that that which you will gain from seeing the Sabbath in the true biblical sense of it being a person and not a day far supersedes that which you will apparently lose. That which you gain is freedom from guilt, an assurance of salvation, and inner peace, a rest in Jesus that supersedes a rest on a day. I implore you, please, as I close, allow the Spirit of Jesus to empower you to think for yourself outside of your crowd. So much more to come, but that's all the time I have for this week. Please come and sit and talk with me at 66A Brunswick Avenue in Spanish Town or listen to the program again on Facebook or at dikayuma.com or biblicalmri.com. It will be posted in short order. God bless you real good. See you next week when I will be dealing with the Ten Commandments. Mm, that's where it gets interesting. Enjoy the rest of your week. Bye-bye for now.